leaked draft opinion from the Supreme Court written by Justice Samuel Alito shows that SCOTUS is poised to overturn the iconic Roe v. Wade decision that was handed down in 1973. That would mark the end of 50 years of permissive coast-to-coast -coast abortion rights, and I put rights in air quotes, uh, of course, because you do not have the right to murder a child, but the left thinks that you do. So immediately following this news, of course, they forgot all about Elon Musk. They dropped all of their gender non-binary language and started squawking about women's rights. And the number of falsehoods and lies that have come out is almost impossible to keep up with. The most ridiculous nonsense you've ever heard painting this idea that women are going to start dying by the thousands, that abortion is going to be banned nationwide, which, believe me, if abortion were going to be banned nationwide, I would be the first one screaming about it. And I would probably have to get in line behind a whole lot of other pro-life leaders uh, who would be so incredibly thrilled at the idea of abortion being banned nationwide because, again, you do not have the right to murder your neighbor. You do not have the right to murder your spouse. You do not have the right to murder a, a, a preborn child. You do not have the right to murder. Unfortunately, that is not what overturning Roe would do, but that is what the left would have you think it's going to do uh, because, again, they're trying to gin up this this crazy scenario in which pro-lifers want women to die uh, and, and don't care about babies and don't care about poor people. Um, but the interesting thing is, the more unhinged they get and the more wild ranting they do, the more the proverbial mask begins to slip. If you notice, there were several prominent left-wing figures this week that maybe revealed a little bit too much about what they actually believe about abortion. For example, here's just a couple. Whoopi Goldberg over on The View admitting that a child is involved in the abortion process and somehow saying that that child is part of the abortion decision making. Take a look at this. This is my body and nobody, you, you know, you got people telling me I got to wear a mask or don't wear a mask or do this. Everybody wants to tell me what to do, but you won't let me make my decision about my body. You are not the person to make that decision. My doctor and myself and my child, that's who makes the decision. And one of the things I really want to point out before we go is the reason abortion came about. Women in this country lived forever with it being illegal, okay? Women, when they decide something is not right for them, they're going to take it into their own hands. Well, we got tired of tripping over women in bathrooms, public bathrooms, who were giving themselves abortions because there was nowhere safe, nowhere clean, nowhere to go. This law came about because people wanted people to have somewhere safe and somewhere clean. It has nothing to do with your religion. This is not a religious issue. This is a human issue. If you care about me as a, as a human being, you should know three things. Getting an abortion is not easy. Making that decision is not easy. It's not something people do lightly. It's not something that you can just do. It, it is a hard, awful decision that people make. And if you don't have the wherewithal to understand that, to start this conversation with, I know how hard this must be for you. If you're starting it, by telling me I'm going to burn in hell, then you're not looking out for me as a human being, whether I subscribe to your religion or not. And that is not okay. Now, of course, um, you know, Whoopi Goldberg, as far as I know, uh, has never even been pregnant. She's never had a child. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what firsthand experience she's talking from. Um, but I can tell you from uh, experience as somebody that has carried and given birth to two children, um, the baby didn't have a whole lot of say in pretty much any decision that I made with my doctor. Um, that is the whole point. Abortion victimizes a human being that doesn't get a say. But if you notice, the use of the word child here exposes the whole facade. Whoopi Goldberg is acknowledging that this does, in fact, involve a child. This is not a clump of cells. This is not a pregnancy. This is not a blob of tissue. This is not um, this sort of, you know, inhuman, 
inanimate object that you're carving out like a cancerous tumor. This is a baby. This is a human child. And they know that. Here's President Joe Biden flat out admitting that abortion kills a child. Can you do away with the filibuster to codify Roe? I'm not, I'm not prepared to make those judgments now. About, uh, But, you know, uh, I think the codification of Roe makes a lot of sense. Look, think what Roe says. Roe says what all basic mainstream religions have historically concluded, that right that the existence of a human life and being is a question. Is it at the moment of conception? Is it six months? Is it six weeks? Is it, is it quickening like Aquinas argued? I mean, so the idea that we're going to make a judgment that is going to say that no one can make the judgment to choose to abort a child based on a decision by the Supreme Court, I think goes way overboard. Again, so what you see, you see the revelation, the left knows what they're doing. Abortion advocates and the abortion industry, and you can bet the abortion doctor themselves, they know exactly what an abortion is and what an abortion does. They prey on the ignorance of very scared, very vulnerable women. But you cannot tell me, and I'm, I, I, I get kind of tired of this narrative. Um, I understand why the pro-life movement has used this for so many years because there was a time, particularly back in 1973 when Roe versus Wade was first handed down, and in the years that followed, ultrasounds were not really a thing. This was not something that, um, there, there, there wasn't a whole lot of common knowledge out there in the general public about the gestational process, about the development of a baby in the womb. Uh, you, you couldn't really look at it. You couldn't, uh, there, there, there wasn't a way to really see it. And a lot of the documentation of the development of human beings in utero was done post row. We have so much evidence. We have so much scientific proof now that for years has verified that an unborn baby is a human being with its own unique DNA marker from conception all the way back in the beginning. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter whether or not it can survive on its own. Again, a, a person on a ventilator can't survive on their own. Uh, a, you know, a teenager doesn't look like an elderly person. Those are not the qualifiers for what makes a human being or what gives a person inherent value. So uh, we, we, we know this now, and the left knows this. So you cannot plead ignorance. In 2022, when we all walk around with devices in our pockets that can access any piece of information that we want, you cannot plead ignorance and say that you don't know that an unborn baby is in fact a human being. And liberals know this. Leftists know this. Abortion advocates know this. Joe Biden knows this. Whoopi Goldberg knows this. And they do not care because they have acknowledged, they have accepted that children can be sacrificed on the altar of politics if it gets them what they want. Whether it's abortion or student loan forgiveness or universal income uh, or, or health care or whatever, the, the left's entire premise is complete and total freedom from consequences. It doesn't matter what decision you make. It doesn't matter uh, what the responsible thing is. You can do whatever you want, and there is a total freedom from consequences. And in the case of abortion, that freedom from consequences can come at the expense of an innocent child, and that is perfectly acceptable to them. And we saw that this week, and we're going to continue to see that uh, if, if, in fact, it does end up that Roe is overturned, which 
It looks in all likelihood that that's exactly what's going to happen, probably will be handed down sometime this summer. And that completely changes the landscape, both for the pro-choice movement and for the pro-life movement. It's going to expose pro-choicers for exactly what they believe. They're going to have to put it in law. They're not going to be able to blame Roe uh, as, as settled law anymore. Um, so they're going to have to establish their position verbatim, and pro-lifers are going to need to have a message that meets that. So so joining me to talk about the Roe versus Wade issue and uh, the Supreme Court potentially overturning it and what that means for the national pro-life movement is Alison Centifante, a good friend of mine. Um, she is a pro-life leader and an advocate for women and children. Uh, Alison, first of all, thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for talking about this. Absolutely. So Allison is very, very busy with her two babies that she has herself. So we appreciate her time. Um, I do want to, I, I don't know if this is the right word. I've kind of been struggling with this, but I almost want to say congratulations because this is such a massive victory, of course, not only for the country, not only for women and children and life and families and the pro-life movement in general, but, but for, for advocates such as yourself who, I mean, this is the culmination of 50 years of tireless work and passing the torch. How does this feel looking at the potential overturning of Roe v. Wade? Yeah, it, it does feel a little bit surreal. You're right, Brittany. I mean, I think there's this weird, um, this mixed feeling in the air because everyone's so shocked about the leak. And we're like, how did this happen? Could it be real? I mean, I think you, I, I think we all remember who sent us the political link, right? Like, I feel like that's going to be a moment in our lives where we're like, I remember when I first saw that headline that Roe v. would be overturned because it has been decades in the works and I've been in it for about a decade, but I stand on the shoulders of so many who came before me and built out the pro-life movement, you know, started creating all of these amazing nonprofits in, in different niches, you know, political advocacy, support for women, pregnancy resource centers. Like I've just spent the last day thinking about how it's taken so many people's sacrifices and innovation and donations to build out a pro-life movement that could get us here where we are today, looking at a potential complete overturning of this massive case that changed the course of history and you know, 60 million lives of children and countless women. Now to be able to say, we were alive when it was reversed, when it was returned back to the States, it's it's really beautiful to sit in this moment for a second. Yeah, say congrats to everyone who works hard, but we know that the work obviously doesn't stop here. No, it absolutely doesn't. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about this because I, I the way that I described it um, when I was talking about it with my own husband was it it feels like um, this, this isn't the finish line. It's just the first leg of the relay. Um, you know, so of course we don't know how to react from such a, a joyful side. Like I almost didn't know what to do with myself. It was, it was, I had to read the headline multiple times. And even then I didn't necessarily believe that Politico had gotten it right. Of course, cause first of all, they're Politico, but also because it just, it seemed too good to be true. But right. of course on the flip side, the, the, the abortion lobby and the abortion industry and the, the leftist advocates of that are just having an absolute meltdown. One of the interesting things I think that this has revealed is, and and maybe you have a theory, I certainly have my own. Um, it feels like either they don't know what Roe actually was and what overturning it will do, or they do know and they're content to just lie to people about it. So kind of this narrative that they're painting where immediately following the overturning of Roe, abortions would be banned nationwide. Women would start dying by the thousands um, and, and just painting this really apocalyptic picture. So, uh, you know, as someone who's been in this industry pushing a, a back against these lies now for years, how false is this? And, and why would they, again, paint such a gruesome picture when that's not at all the, that's not at all the truth? Yeah, it's a great question. It, this has been really revealing about the intentions of the left and the way, if you step back, and the way that they conjure up hysteria. Um, you mean, it was last week that we were talking about gender and what is a woman. And then this week it's, well, you're attacking women's rights and a woman is someone who can get pregnant. And they, the pivot was fast <laughs> to realizing quickly what a woman was. And then to lean into, like you're saying, the lies and the confusion. Um, this is revealing. We've always known via polling that people don't know what Roe v. Wade is, right? You've been in the movement. You know, 
when people generally are asked, do you support Roe v. Wade? They may say yes. But when you say, well, what is Roe v. Wade? They don't know. If you educate them on what it does, on what Roe did to legalize abortion through all nine months, if you educate them a little bit, it changes their mind about Roe. If you educate them on the abortion procedure, you then take another step forward and they're even more pro-life, add on a little bit of fetal development and you start moving people in a direction of, of waking up to the truth of what this procedure does and what the industry does. So the left can't educate in that way. They're not going to talk about what abortion is. I'm sure they're pretty upset that Biden actually said that abortion is killing a child today because they like to hide behind those euphemisms, a clump of cells. Um, you know, Kamala is out there talking about freedom and, and in, um, bodily autonomy and all of these words that allow them to not talk about abortion. People have no idea. So I think that is revealing. I think it's also an opportunity for us. You know, Brittany, I'm sure you and I, we have in our direct messages and texts, people just asking questions. And it does feel like even the left, we use that always thinking of strangers, but the left, people in our lives are now directly pursuing, saying, well, what about this? What about Jackie who might die if she doesn't get an abortion? And what about this made up hypothetical? That's good. Let's lean into that moment and answer those questions. Let's lean into that and go, okay, here's the thing. Why, why is Jackie being told she's going to die? Oh, you, you miscarried. Okay. Well, let's talk about miscarriage. Treatment of miscarriage is different than an intentional abortion, right? Like we we're going to have to, to, to still align from the left, do the work of explaining to our friends and family, the difference between abortion and miscarriage treatment. What is an ectopic pregnancy? And we're not, we're no one's targeting that and how women are not going to go to jail. That's not the legislation that's in front of us. And, you know, so now's the time if you're listening and you are pro-life, but you have a question maybe that bugs you, get the answer, sit down, take one of these amazing, you know, e-courses that all these groups offer, um, do the research. It's out there. So many pro-life advocates have really worked really hard to answer all these questions so you can walk faithfully, boldly in telling the truth, but it's time to not just be pro-life in like politics. You're going to have to be pro-life in action, in speech, um, getting involved in the movement, even if that's simply like, if you're a stay at home mom listening to this, I actually think you have such a cool opportunity, not just with your kids, but like, you don't have to be door knocking. You don't have to be fundraising. You can be talking to your friends and family, using your social media, using whatever to educate. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here for us to educate our friends and families. There's, they are outraged off of lies right now. And we have to work through that. Absolutely. Because if we don't, I mean, that's the thing is if we don't know the truth and if we don't share the truth, then they're going to be able to share this false narrative. And I think it's it's incredibly sad. And I, I know you've said this for a long time. Uh, those of us who who have, have been harping on this issue for a long time, it's the saddest thing in the world because the abortion industry, this multi-million dollar abortion industry that makes money off of this preys directly on the fear of women who are very scared. I mean, I'll tell you, I've I've had two babies uh with with my husband and even even children that we desired even children that we that we tried for that we desperately wanted it's an intimidating thing becoming a mother it should be an intimidating thing becoming a mother it is a massive life change um and so when you are faced with an unplanned pregnancy that can be an incredibly scary thing. So the, the abortion industry is preying on that fear and preying on that vulnerability and using that moment to, again, paint this apocalyptic scenario in which thousands of women are keeling over and blood is running in the streets from all of these women dying of abortions, which of course is not the way that it was if you look at the years leading up to Roe. Um, that, that is a completely false narrative. So you're exactly right that, um, that making sure that the truth gets out there and that women have access to it, which I, I think is an important, another important thing to talk about here when it comes to overturning Roe, regardless of how Rachel Maddow wants to paint it, that it's going to ban abortions nationwide, like overnight, it's going to kick the issue of abortion back to states. And so I think for the pro-life movement, it now, not that there's going to be a, um, you know, it, not that there's going to be some perfect dichotomy, but in general, I think it's going to split 
the battlefield into sort of two different groups, at least the way that I look at it. You've got your more conservative states that are going to restrict abortion access. And so I think that the way that the pro-life movement approaches that issue and those challenges is going to be one, one area that I think we need to start talking about and really grappling with. And then, of course, over on the other side, you're going to have more liberal states like your Californias, like your New Yorks, that are going to rapidly expand abortion access, uh, some of them all the way up through nine months of pregnancy. So can you talk a little bit, and I know that we're kind of coming off of a, a victory that hasn't even quite been realized yet, but as we look forward to that, how does this shift the goal for the national pro-life movement? Yeah, great question. Um, someone's actually asked me today, we're like, well, what are pro-life groups going to do now? And it's like, okay, clearly you have no idea. There's so much that continues, right? Like we're not done and we don't pack up and um, it's like our parents being like, okay, well, what will you do now? <laughs> like, we are going to have to continue to educate and encourage legislators to do the right thing. I mean, right now, now they can't hide behind, well, Roe is law of the land and this wouldn't do well in court and all of those kind of internal dynamics. We're going to need to continue to support women in unplanned pregnancies. Groups like Let Them Live um, are out there raising money, walking with women through their unplanned pregnancy, like you said, you know, it's scary enough with a support system. If every pro-lifer should look themselves in the eye and imagine being in a vulnerable situation and how much it would take for you to choose life, to, to carry that baby for nine months, knowing that they're going to have 90 years on this planet, but those nine months, I mean, to the, even the idea of placing for adoption, Brittany, is a big deal. We kind of say that flippantly, place them for adoption. Birth moms are some of the bravest in the world. We've got groups out there like, you know, Lifeline Children's Services is one that I work with that helps people with foster care and adoption and honors the mom who is choosing the best for their child. It's still incredibly, incredibly hard. Um, the movement continues. There's so much work to be done. Uh, the debate, in fact, I think gets even stronger because now people realize it's not the status quo anymore, right? We can't just say Roe is law of the land and move on. What I do hope happens, though, is we force these debates in the states and everyone's going to have to decide, right? Like, do I want to be in a state that is extremely permissive of abortion, uses my tax dollars for abortion? Um, I was talking to someone today and they're like, look, don't forget the Federalist Papers talk about the states being a laboratory. This is why you can vote with your feet. This is why you have seen people leave states like California, like New York, for more free states like, you know, Florida, Alabama, Texas, because you vote with your feet. Now, that's not up for everyone. I, I kind of feel like, you know, I feel like when they told us to get electric cars to help with gas, like I'm not saying everyone has to move if you don't like the abortion policy in your state. Stay there, change things, change hearts and minds. But the states have always been a laboratory of sorts that this is how it should work. Um, and I hope that through this debate and, and we're going to start seeing this, if this is the final decision, and I hope it is, if this is the final decision, we're going to see pro-life individuals realize it's going to have to be more than donations. It's going to have to be more than this like national macro level of, of being pro-life. It's going to have to be individual. It's looking at your own life and going, what am I doing? Am I involved with the embrace grace in my town? Um, I've talked about this on social media, but I can't do everything. You can't do everything. But I knew Embrace Grace was in my town. It's a great group taking care of moms that are pregnant. And I wanted to be a part of it. I don't have time to lead it. I don't have time to do counseling. But I went to one meeting and I heard her say that she cooks a meal for these girls every week at their meeting. And I was like, well, that's a lot. Can I take that off your shoulders? I'm no cook, Brent. I'm not going to cook for all these girls. But I like literally just made all my friends and family like chip in. I'm like, okay, we're going to get them Chick-fil-A. Um, and then sweet ladies in the neighborhood wanted to cook. So I just made sure that that task was covered for the leader. I just say that not like to pat my own back, but like, that's just a small thing to help another person leading a pro-life effort, right? Like I'll make sure these girls have a warm meal. That's the least I can do. So make it personal, make it small, make it, make it micro of what you're doing to help. Because I think that that's really how we stay soft in this. I appreciate you staying soft. Some leaders have not, you know, they kind of get hard on this, but staying soft, staying close to the problem, 
remembering that as a mom, it is really hard. Um, I, I see all these memes floating around right now and images like, well, how dare they force birth when we don't have, you know, paid universal maternity leave and we don't, we have a high infant mortality rate. We have a high, um, female mor- motherly mortality rate. And, and I go, yeah, we do. Like, we should work on these things. We should come together and figure out how to get every mom to go home with a lactation consultant and some, some support, some mentorship, but uh, there's so, you know, we could talk all day. We do a whole podcast on like how the system is broken as moms now that we've gone through it. That as I go to my OB every week, and then as soon as I have the baby, I don't see him for six weeks. And no, heaven forbid, you know, anything go wrong. I'm I'm technically alone unless I have, thank God I have a great husband, right? Like there's so much we can join hands to do, but instead the left chooses to take their energy and just focus on abortion. So well, and I think this is going to be a huge opportunity for that. I think this is going to be a huge opportunity for that because I think that there has been so so many misconceptions about the pro life movement about those who who are reaching out to support these women. Um, and I think that the interesting thing is with the states that are going to push even more radical left that are going to want to expand abortion access, they're going to have to put it on record where they think the abortion cutoff should be and whether they actually think that it should be okay to abort a child all the way up through full term, Um, whether it's okay to single out children who have Down syndrome and some of the more horrific things that we've seen. And they're going to have to go on record. You're exactly right. They're not going to be able to hide behind Roe anymore. They're going to have to go on record with these things. And I, I think it's going to show if we, if we can stop playing just the defense, if we can play offense with the truth and make sure that it gets out there and make sure that, um, you know, that we are living out what we say we believe, there's going to be such a stark difference between those who support women, who support their children, who support families, and then those that are willing to just completely throw them under, under the bus, make their money off of an abortion, and then completely abandon that woman to whatever comes. Um, and, and I think that that's going to be a, a very, very stark difference that we need to, we need to point out. I, I did have one quick question and I know that this is a bit speculative here, obviously. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't care nearly as much about the leak as other people seem to. It's not that I don't think that it's important. I absolutely think that it's important at the same time. Um, you know, the idea that, oh, well, it's going to mess up the November midterms. Quite frankly, I never think that there's a bad time to start saving babies. Uh, so that's not really my huge priority. I don't think that that's going to be the case regardless. Um, but all that to say, there is some, um, I know some concern that lawmakers are now going to rush to codify Roe, uh, not just as a decision, but codify it into law, particularly at the federal level, which I think is going to be very, very difficult to do. Um, But among national pro-life leaders, is this something that y'all are watching that you are concerned about? Yeah, absolutely. You're 100% right. I mean, you see these liberal politicians out there talking about bringing in the sweeping legislation and make abortion, you know, again, law of the land. It's likely not to happen. They don't have the votes, thank God, which is a reminder that voting matters, elections matter. But it reveals, again, why it's so important to, I think we're going to eventually need a constitutional amendment for these children, because we need to say that you are protected from the moment of conception in this country, and that we're not continually playing this state v. federal thing out. Um, And I was listening to uh, Josh Hammer from Newsweek talk about this exactly of what happens if they somehow do, you know, change the filibuster rules and codify it into law and now with the states. And it gets pretty crazy. And yet again, these children's lives are caught in the balance of adults who know the truth, who know what happened, what a pregnancy is and what abortion is, fighting over, you know, the ability to kill them, dismember them, poison them, and to not support women. So I think, again, I don't think it's going to happen, like you said, but this is why we need to move to make it a make sure that these children have the same constitutional right to life that we all do. All Americans should be protected by law. And that ha- that is a unique human being at the moment of conception. Um, and when a child is born, you know, they do not get some birth certificate that says, oh, they were born of rape or their parents are poor. No, you're born. And we need to acknowledge that in our country, you can become anything you want to be. We have great stories, success stories. Children that were raised in foster care, you know, adopted product, uh, children that were, you know, conceived in rape. 
it doesn't matter. We want you to have the right to life, to be born, to have a chance to, you know, execute your purpose in this world. Um, but the left is using this to hype up hysteria. And I'm with you. I don't, I think some people are wrongfully focusing on the leak, but my concern is safety. I think this is incredibly dangerous. Um, I think of Amy Coney Barrett with all of her children. I'm like, I would be, you know, bunkering down. It's incredibly dangerous for the left to whoever leaked this or whatever, you know, scheme was done to put the justices and their families in this position. I mean, heaven forbid something should happen to them. Um, because now the left is hyped up. You're seeing it. There's protests at the Supreme Court. There's protests in L.A. They're getting violent. Um and today, the New York Times ran this article, Brittany, that says it's time to rage. It's so reckless. We saw what happened in the summer with the riots of Black Lives Matter. I mean, we don't want to repeat history. And so I think that we do need to pursue justice in the case of the leak. We don't want it to be a normal process in our democracy. We also pray that these justices do not change their minds, because if they do, it proves that the leak worked and that you can bully Supreme Court justices. And that's not okay. That is not how the system is set up. It's not political. It's not legislative. It is different. It has always been set apart. So I hope we can restore that back to the court. Yeah. I think that it goes to show one thing and that that is that the the so-called right to abortion, which you don't have, by the way, you do not have a right to murder anybody. I don't care what's written in law, but the so-called right to abortion um, is the left's religion. It is their holy grail uh, and they're going to fight for it. So I definitely think that we've got um, the next the next battlefront on our hands. And you're exactly right. The lives of women and their children hang in the balance. Um, and, and we need to make sure that we're ready for that. Um, so thank you so much for everything that you do. Uh, you guys, I just, I cannot overstate the amount of work and effort and effort that has gone into just getting the fight this far, just getting to uh, this victory. So thank you for that. Thank you for coming on the show. Enjoy those babies. Give them lots of hugs from us. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back on soon. Thank you guys. And you guys are a part of that, by the way, you guys in getting the news out, covering this issue fairly, giving pro-lifers a platform to talk about what we're experiencing and what we want, and what we hope for is part of the solution and part of the win here. So thank you. Thank you. Allison Chentafonte, everybody. Again, thank you for being with us. So in talking about how pro-lifers can actually deal with this issue on the ground, when talking about kind of bringing it down from uh, a sort of a macro issue um, and, and, and really boiling it down to what does this mean for you? What does this mean for me? As pro-lifers, as people who want to support life uh, and, and who want to see a post-Roe world not only exist, but flourish. I think that's now the next battlefront. That's now the question that pro-lifers are going to have to grapple with. So here to talk with me a little bit today about not just the potential end of Roe versus Wade, but how that's actually going to affect the boots on the ground, how that's going to affect the the day-to-day -day of the pregnancy clinics that are actually dealing with this issue specifically in real time. Uh, we have the director of CareNet Pregnancy Center of Southern Maryland, Olivia Bosser. Olivia, thank you so much for being with me today. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, so I have known Olivia for several years now. Uh, we have worked together a little bit on this issue. Uh, and I got to tell you, Olivia and the staff that she has there at CareNet are completely hands-on with this issue. This is not something that is some big hypothetical 37,000 feet in the air issue for them. This is something that they deal with every single day, which is, Olivia, exactly why I wanted to talk to you about this. Because I think sometimes... Um, when talking about Roe, when talking about the Supreme Court, we we kind of have this uh, overarching view when this actually affects your day to day. So I, I want to start by asking you, you know, we've really seen this past week, abortion advocates have painted this sort of apocalyptic picture of a post Roe world where women are dying by the thousands and women who are faced with unplanned pregnancies can't get the help that they need and they're left totally on their own. Um, not only is that a lie, but that completely ignores the work that you're doing right now. So can you tell me a little bit about your clinic and how pregnancy clinics like yours are offering medical services and support to these women, even right now, while we're still, while Roe is still effectually, um, you know, in effect? Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, we have been here, Care Net Pregnancy Center has been here for over 30 years. We've been in this community. We serve two counties. We have medical clinics in each of our offices. We offer free and confidential and um, safe support and services to every client that comes to us. And it's not just the woman, not just mom, it's dad, boyfriend, uh, partner, aunts, uncles, grandmas. If you want to support somebody in your life who's facing an unplanned pregnancy or who has decided to carry a pregnancy to term, we are here for you. And so um, over the last 30 years, our services have evolved, but we currently, we primarily offer um, for those who think that they're pregnant, we have um, free pregnancy tests and limited obstetric ultrasounds. Um, we do um, the STI and STD testing for men and women, because if you're having sex, you should get tested to protect yourself and everybody else. Um, and then if you choose to carry to term, we have supportive services for you and your family, clothing, diapers, wipes, formula, uh, baby food, equipment. We have families who have done our parenting classes, which we have hundreds of classes. Um, available to anybody in the family who wants to take them. And um, they earn dollars in our baby boutique to get free things. To And we've had families who have built their entire baby baby uh, nurseries out of stuff that they have gotten from us. And, um, and then for those women who have chosen abortion, which the, you're triggered uh, and re-traumatized for years later, we have support for them to come in for healing when they're ready. So I the the fascinating part to all of this when you think about that I think is is twofold. So the first is the the simple fact that not only do you provide medical services, not only do you provide ultrasounds, not only do you provide STD testing things like that. Um you also provide support through birth and then beyond, which I, I think is fascinating when you hear accusations from the left, from the abortion advocates, from that, that industry, that pro-life people don't actually care about moms and babies after the baby is born, when in fact, it's actually the abortion industry that doesn't care. The I'd abortion like industry is the one that don't have, offer those services. I'd like to know how many of the pro-choicers, pro-abortions, pro-abortionists have adopted babies foster parents? How many of them have actually done all the things that they're accusing us that we're not doing? Exactly. And and the other thing too is the financial aspect of it, which I know that we we don't talk quite as much about because, you know, we we definitely want to keep the focus on moms and on babies and on making sure that we do everything we possibly can to support them, but there is a financial element here. Uh so can you can you talk a little bit about that because you're talking about um and and maybe most people don't realize this. I don't know if they do or not, but when women go in for abortions, the abortion industry, abortion clinics, including pan Planned Parenthood, they charge for their services, Absolutely. whether they're charging the client or they're charging the insurance company or they're charging Medicaid, they're charging the government. They are getting reimbursed for their services. I mean, Planned Parenthood makes over $500 million a year off of government grants to reimburse for these services, as opposed to pregnancy clinics like yours that are almost, if not entirely dependent upon donations. So what is that like going up against a multi-million dollar abortion industry and the lobbyists that support it? Uh, the easiest way to, to describe it would be David and Goliath. That's literally what who we are in this fight. We don't have the millions and billions of dollars. We don't have government funding. We have the prayers and support of our community, of churches, of people who believe in the work that we do, of people who've been affected by the work that we do, and who want to see their community change for good. And, um, you know, you know this. I know that that this is part of your world, but to get advertising out, to get it in front of the clients uh, and the community for people who would see us it's harder and harder every day that goes on and it's just going to get worse. And so in order to get those keywords um, on Google for clients, you know, abortion near me to, to pay for the word abortion to pop up for our name, it costs more money because we're against competing against Planned Parenthood to get those keywords. And um, so then it just gets trickier and trickier because if you're pro-life, if you are against abortion and, and the, advertising companies can pinpoint you as such, then they will hide your posts. They will um, 
uh, censor you. And so how do we how do we fight that? It's it's an ongoing battle. And every time we feel like we are making some headway, something changes. Which I find really interesting from the supposedly pro-choice crowd that you would think if they really were so pro-choice, they would make sure that women had the information to make an informed decision and that they knew all of their options. And at the same time, they'll censor pro-life voices that want to make sure women know they do have the option to choose life. They can become mothers. They do have a support system that's fascinating to me and wildly hypocritical. Um, Exactly. It's definitely hypocritical. It is um, almost like a bipolar mentality that, oh, we're all for choice. We want to support you, but we only support you if it falls within these guidelines versus when you come to us, we will educate you on abortion. We will check your gestation. We'll do a sonogram to see how far along you are in your pregnancy. And we will tell you if you choose abortion, these are the options that are available for you. Now, I'm very careful that everyone understands we don't refer or we don't perform abortions, but each woman has a right to know what's going to happen to their body. And that's what the pro-choice movement doesn't want them to know. If you know that you're going to have to deliver this baby, regardless of whether you terminate the pregnancy or not, that will impact a woman's decision on whether she's going to carry or not. If, If they tell you that you're going to lay in a pool of blood when you're delivering your baby in a hotel room or at home completely by yourself and instead tell you, oh, it's just a heavy period, that's not support. That's not empowerment. And we want you to be prepared. And so we want if if that's a choice you make, which we hope that it's not, you deserve to know what you're up against. And you deserve to know that when when you change your mind and we hope that you change your mind, there's still abortion pill reversal that we are now offering or getting ready to or this close to launching it. There are options. There is support. There are people who care about you, who truly want to see the best for you and for your child. So, I, th- I mean, their ability to twist the narrative and their ability to kind of um, skew the facts, again, the, the idea that they are pro-choice when they limit women's access to so much information is insane. I, I think it's been very interesting to watch this week the way that they try to jump on uh, the, the idea of a post-Roe world, the, the picture that they paint. And one of the most fascinating things to me is, um, and, and I, have a, I have a personal theory on it, but Either a lot of these um, pro-abortion leaders or media pundits, they either don't know what Roe actually did and what would happen if it were overturned, or they do know and they're intentionally lying about it. And this idea that if, if Roe is overturned immediately across the nation, abortion would be banned. Even if that's what we kind of wish would happen, even if that's what should happen in a good and moral and ethical world, that's not what overturning Roe would do. It would kick the abortion issue back to the states. So I find this very interesting. And part of the reason I wanted to talk to you specifically, you're in a unique position. I think being in Maryland. So some states that are very much more conservative would would seek to uh, vastly limit women's access to abortion, whereas uh, more liberal states would probably expand access to abortion. And that's going to completely change the battlefield for the pro-life movement. In Maryland, however, in a blue state where you're led by a Republican governor, I think it's a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more unique. So let's just hypothetically say in a a post-Roe world, the day after Roe is overturned, assuming that it actually will be, um, what is that discussion that you have with your staff the next day? Honestly, it's the same discussion that we have every single day. Our work doesn't change. We're still going to be doing the same work that we've always done. We're going to do it the same way. We're just going to hopefully do more of it. You know, the, the, we have been brainstorming because we have been hoping that this has been, this is coming this summer, but the hardest part will be how do we get in front of those women earlier? Because if abortion is going to be available on demand, if it's going to be available, the abortion pill, which I'm sure is coming is, uh, I think they're pushing for it to be over the counter. So anybody can get it. Your boyfriend can get it. Nobody knows how far along you are, how much more, not healthcare can you get when you're <laughs> you're getting abortion over the counter when there's so many consequences, so many risks to the mom? Um, and so how do we educate them better? How do we reach them more? Th- those are the conversations that we're having. Um, and, how, you know, 
trying to anticipate the barriers that are coming, but it's not changing. It's not changing our work. Everything is still we're moving forward. I think one thing that that could change, though, that I think pro-lifers uh, that are concerned about the, this issue and that are uh, excited about the potential overturning of Roe, I think one thing that we really do need to grapple with um, is the potential increased for demand from women who may need help, may need support, may need services. Um, so when it when it comes to the on the ground efforts that again you guys do every single day. Uh, what can pro-lifers do to get more involved and why is it so crucial that they do that now as opposed to waiting until Roe is overturned if in fact it is? Well, we need we need the help now. We need the financial support now. We need um, the, the, the fundraising. We need the, um, uh, the technical support. We need um, supporters in our centers who are available to meet the demand of the clients who are finding us. Um, and so if you can get involved now, then we are prepared for what I hope is is uh, uh, higher traffic that of the people who find us who are going to need us. You know, you look at Virginia and with their very conservative pro-life governor, um, I anticipate that a lot of them are going to be coming over here to Maryland to try to get those services. And I have been saying to our donors and to the community for years you guys are all praying for a, a post-war culture, a post-post-row uh, society. But if you're not by, you know, coming alongside the pregnancy centers, then what are you doing in your churches? Are the churches ready to handle these women who need support? Um, because we only we will do whatever we can if we had the money to do it. You know, you have women who um, are choosing abortion because of financial problems or domestic violence problems. Let's find a way to fix those issues so that abortion is off the table completely. So if you really want a post row world, then you need to be helping us come up with the solutions for those problems instead of just saying, oh, I'm pro-life. And I, I, I want to be careful because we, we appreciate all the support, but just saying I'm pro-life and then doing nothing is still doing nothing. Right. You know, you so, can be a keyboard warrior all you want, but but what are you doing to take action to help? So that's one thing that um, that I've always said. I've I've always kind of said the the one thing that we want so badly is to see Roe overturned again. Of course, that does not nix abortion nationwide. That does not mean that other states are not going to go whole hog into expanding abortion access all the way up through the ninth month. I mean, we've got we've got some. Some legislatures that are even mulling over uh, laws that that at least hint, if not outright state, uh, at, at flat out infanticide, even after a baby is born, or allowing survivors of abortion uh, to, to die without medical care. So we're talking about some of the most extremist views that the vast majority of, abor uh, of Americans, even those who support uh, choices in earlier trimesters and in earlier weeks, the vast majority of Americans do not support this. And so that's kind of what we're looking at headed down the road for some of these states. And I've long since said uh, that if we got what we wanted. If Roe were to be overturned, are we ready to fight those next battles? And are we ready to offer the support that we would need to offer to these women? So I think uh, moving forward, and again, part of the reason I wanted you to come on the show so bad is I think that this is the next level of discussion that we need to start having, that pro-lifers pro need to start having uh, in a real kind of come to Jesus moment because, um, you know, uh, again, I, and I've I've had some people tell me, well, look, Brittany, it's 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 okay to celebrate the victory. It's okay to take a breather. This was the culmination of years of work, uh, and I and I get that, and I think that that's um, that's very valid. But at the same time, this is not a victory that doesn't come with a very close step to. There is an end. Then there are consequences uh, to row being overturned. And, um, and one of those is just making sure that women know that they do have the support. Because again, uh, when you, when you hear the left talk, when you hear abortion advocates talk, when you hear the media talk, there's this idea that all of these women are going to be left totally on their own. And that is not true. I think your clinic is a testament to the fact that that's not true. There are thousands of other clinics all across this country. Make sure, uh, if you're watching this and if you're listening, go find your 
local pregnancy clinic. Get involved, volunteer, make donations, contribute financially. Um, these places cannot do the work that they do. We cannot exist in a post row world without that support. So it's time for us to step up and be who we've always said that we are going to be. So um, just one last question I really want to ask you, because I know that there are people that are listening to this that don't necessarily agree uh, with our views on life and, and, and frankly are intimidated and scared about a post row world because of the narrative that they've been fed. So just real quick, uh, last question, what would be your message to women who are facing unplanned pregnancies or who fear that they may be in the future and don't think that they're going to have access to abortion? Um, what would be your message to those women? I think that's a really good question and definitely something that I know that our ladies are struggling with in our community. The media and the culture want you to be afraid, but there are options. There are people who care. There are people who actually have are praying for you right now and want to help you. I encourage you to reach out to your local pregnancy center, reach out to your local churches and 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 get connected. We want we have services that we have set aside just for you um, to help you in the time of crisis and beyond. And we want to be here for you. Abortion is not your only answer. Well, thank you again, Olivia. I do appreciate it. I think. I think that these voices are vital. I think, like I said, a lot of times we tend to talk about these overarching issues from a legislative perspective, from a national perspective, uh, using numbers and statistics and millions of dollars. But to you guys, these are women. To you guys, these are faces. These are our ladies with, with actual names and with actual stories. And y'all do this work every single day, pushing back the darkness. So again, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. So that's it for the Brittany Hughes Show for today. I do want to leave you with one thought because this is always a heavy subject, even when you're talking about your victories. The, the fact that in 2022, we are still debating whether or not it should be legal to poison and dismember unborn children. That we are still debating whether or not um, women, vulnerable women, should continue to be victimized. The fact that we're still grappling with these questions in the age of information is truly stunning, and it can be incredibly uh, disheartening, particularly for those who um, have lost children that were desperately wanted. I know some of you watching have been through that scenario. Uh, some of you are um, trying for children that you are desperately praying for. And these news cycles can be incredibly difficult. So I want to leave you with this. Always remember, there is no scenario in which the end does not play out exactly as we've been told. It's done. The way that this ultimately plays out, God wins. Justice wins. Life wins. The, the end is written. It's already done. There is no scenario in which this cult of death prevails. Not a single one. The victory has already been declared. The chapter has already been written. The book has been published. I've got some copies. I can send you one if you need it. It's done. The only thing that's left to determine is which side you're going to be on when it's finished. But make no mistake, there will be ultimate justice for every single life lost to abortion. Every single one. And life will ultimately prevail. So just remember that. Remember that when it's dark and when it's difficult and when it seems like, um, you know, we're, we're going to have some victories in the future. We're going to have uh, pro-life laws being passed that protect the unborn, that protect families and protect women. And we're going to see that. And we're going to cheer that on. And at the same time, we are going to see some of the most perverse efforts to expand infanticide from liberals that are absolutely outraged that their sacred cow is now being tipped. So when you're discouraged, when you feel like the darkness is too heavy, just remember that at the end of the day, it's already all said and done. Make sure that you're on the right side when that happens. 
So with that, that is the Brittany Hughes Show. Thank you so much for being with us today. We will see you back here next Thursday. In the meantime, make sure that you head over to iTunes, subscribe so that you do not miss an episode. Very important. You can also check us out on Spotify, Odyssey, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and you can find full episodes of the show on YouTube and Rumble, as well as Facebook and Instagram. We will see you back here next week.